Nala Ayed had a typical Canadian upbringing. At first, raised in Winnipeg, worked hard at school, rode her bike, played with her friends outside the small house on Archibald Street that she shared with her siblings and parents. Like a lot of Canadians, Nala's parents had a hyphenated identity, Palestinian Canadians, who had grown up as refugees and planted roots in Canada. Nala and her siblings learned Arabic at home where the sounds of the Lebanese superstar Ferouz blended with the songs of B.J. Thomas. But Nala's parents were concerned that their children would not properly learn about their heritage. So in 1976, when Nala was just six, the family moved to a Palestinian refugee camp in Jordan. She remembers the grinding poverty, the anger, and the sadness. So she was profoundly affected by what she saw and heard in the camp. So following her return to Winnipeg at the age of 13, Nala pursued a career in journalism. And she spent much of the last decade back in the Middle East, covering wars, conflicts, and uprisings for the CBC. They say their ultimate aim is to get to Tripoli. This makes it a lot easier for them to actually get there. Now someone who has dedicated herself to telling other people stories tells her own tale of how she navigated that great transition in her life. It's all in her new memoir called A Thousand Farewells. Please welcome Nell Ryan. Nice to meet you. Good to see you. Welcome to the show. Thanks very much. How's things? Very good. To sit down and tell a story, tell your story and other stories in, in, a, in a book. Is it a daunting um, a daunting moment for you to sit back and let's, let's spell this out. I'm actually shocked that I ever even got it done. <laughs> it was a huge task. I mean, we're used to doing two and a half minute pieces for the news. And so to write 110,000 words was, was quite something for me. Well, so. your, your own story is so interesting. I mean, for people who don't know it, so here you are living a life in Winnipeg and then your father says, hey, guess what? We're going to go and live in a Palestinian refugee camp in Jordan. Yes. Why? There's a lot of reasons. I mean, as I say in the book, I mean, there are a lot of people in Canada, a lot of parents who come from somewhere else. And they come here because they want their children to have the best opportunities they possibly can. But they're also kind of, they've got two minds about this stuff. They want the best opportunities, but they're also very worried about being responsible for having their children lose the traditions, lose the language, lose perhaps a religion as well. And so there are people who seriously think about this the moment they have a child and so my parents did as well when they had us and they had sort of make, made a pact if you will that they would invest in some way in making sure that we know our relatives and we know our culture and that kind of thing and so that was the, the reason of course as a six-year-old child you're like what did I do to deserve this <laughs> but there's one thing to to want to preserve the culture and speak the language at home there's something completely different to move the family and then choose to live in essentially a refugee camp, right? True, but it's also one thing to, as my mother did, put a board on the, on the back of a kitchen wall and teach you the alphabet in Arabic. And it's another thing to actually enroll you in a school along with a bunch of other Arab girls to kind of learn what it's like to be an Arab girl and to, to, and to speak the language properly. Well, and so the, the reality is going from Winnipeg to there is, there is a huge culture difference. And I mean, even what you wore yeah. had to change, didn't yeah. it? Yeah, it, it was the definition of a culture shock. I mean, I, I'd never actually experienced culture shock like I did then, even though it was my culture. Um, but yes, as we grew older, um, especially in, in that environment, that year, those times, most people, most women who, of the Muslim faith did actually wear the hijab once they sort of turned 13, 14. And so it was, it was never explicitly, well, it was later, but it wasn't initially explicitly you know, told to us that, listen, you've got to wear it, but it's sort of expected. And so when my sister and I sort of reached around the age of 13, 12, 13, we did actually wear the hijab while we were there. Yes. Did you ever resent that? I did. And it's a, a difficult thing to say because I certainly respect, you know, people's choice to wear it if they, if they, if they so choose. Um, I resented it because my mother never wore it and I could tell that she wasn't comfortable wearing it And so knowing she was uncomfortable and that I was uncomfortable I did resent it and I said as I sort of explained in the book too I, I actually physically found it difficult to wear. I mean at school it was hard to hear I found it hot and I was really kind of to tomboyish too So it kind of got in the way <laughs> you have a very different relationship then um, with With a Muslim culture and then being a journalist telling the stories. I mean you're under a different you're under a different microscope. You know, when there's an issue that happens in Alberta, nobody asks if the white guy covering it is giving the white perspective. Right. But when uh, an Arab reporter in any way, mm -hmm. um, uh, anybody who lived in a Muslim culture tells the story, they just think that it has an agenda. Yes. Do you, do you, have you experienced that? Yes, it comes up quite often. And I think it comes up for, for all kinds of people who do the sort of thing, who are of a certain extraction or a certain religion. I mean, in my case, 
it has come up and sometimes to my face. I mean, you know, people will come up and say, well, you're biased, you're Arab, you're Palestinian, you're of a Muslim background, so what does that all mean? Do you just forget all that? And the reason my background makes a difference is because I know the language, I can talk to people, I can actually hear, you know, the little jokes and rumors in a big crowd that nobody else could hear. So I think what I bring is more the context, a little bit more detail than the average journalist would if they didn't speak the language, if they didn't know the culture. Well, certainly with the Arab Spring, because, in, you know, the Arab Spring is called the Arab Spring. There are different issues in different countries and different reasons why people are angry. I mean, there's a, some fundamental reasons that are kind of universal, but it's, it's, what's been your relationship like with that story over the last year? It's been an, it, just an incredible story for me. I, it was uh, the culmination, I guess, of, of a study of, of a region. Because I, when I went to the Middle East, even as a child, and even when I returned again, I knew a bit, but I didn't know everything. And as you say, every country is different. And so this was kind of almost like getting the, the MA or the PhD at the end of a very long <laughs> study. Well, telling the story is one thing, but then having the story be heard with open ears is a completely different thing. Did you feel like the, the Western world, Canada specifically, was hearing what it is reporters were saying? I think they did at the beginning of the Arab Spring. I think <clears throat> a lot of questions were asked that were never asked before, actually. And I was surprised. I remember sitting uh, in Cairo as soon as we had arrived uh, uh, that day on the 28th of January last year and sitting you know, on the floor and at the business center and, and being on the phone for about 15 minutes straight and the anchor asking me these questions that I was like, wow, these questions, I've never been asked these questions and I, I thought about all this stuff. And so I think there was a great amount of interest because there was so much excitement and there was, you know, all these young people coming out. It's like, why, why are they there? Mm -hmm. They're not protesting against the U.S. or Israel or what, really? And so I, I think there was interest then. I think now the, way, the interest has waned. I think there's a great amount of interest in that, but not perhaps as much as there was last year. It was a happier story last year. Yeah, sure. Well, that, well it, but what's interesting about the happier story is that I think people just expect that, like, like in a movie, the story will happen and then we'll have a result. But it takes a long time to have results, and people exactly. don't know what's going to happen in Egypt yeah. and other countries. Well, and, and people assume that because there is some, uh, I guess, bad things happening now, that it's over. Everyone says to me, no, the spring is over, it's now winter. I'm like, well, no, wait a second. There are things happening in the Middle East now that would never have happened had the spring not come along. And I think that, and like, to build on what you said, the real big next step is going to be when all these young girls now realize, you know what, it doesn't actually have to be this way, and those steps won't be small anymore. Those steps, like, you get that feeling that at some point that's the power base that's going to change this. Are, you, is, are those conversations happening now? Absolutely. I mean, I think it's the neat thing about today's world is you can actually follow some of these conversations on Twitter. I love yeah. that. And even though I'm not actually there now full time, I, I do follow those conversations and they're happening. I mean, people, there are protests every day in Cairo. Sometimes little protests, 12, 13 people, 14, upset about, you know, who their faculty uh, leader is or who their dean is, you know, and they want to protest and change that. So I think th those things are happening. And th those, that generation is going to grow up and hopefully be part of the establishment, part of the elite that could help determine where these countries go next. Do you, um, do you not being there, as you mentioned, mm -hmm. regularly, I mean, there is this idea that coming back to Canada, the stories just aren't as on the surface exciting, even though there's an, an amazing array of stories here. Yes. What was the adjustment like for you? It was extremely difficult, but I kind of blame myself for that because I stayed away far longer than I ever expected to. I told my sister and my parents who had to put all my stuff in their storage, you know, couple of years I'll be back. Seven years went by before I came home. I was addicted to that story so like any addiction you kind of have to undo it. As somebody who has the heritage you have, do you feel you have a responsibility to, for lack of a better term, your heritage? Mm -hmm. I'm not sure that's the word that, that I would use but I think we all come with a set of skills and either you take advantage of them or you don't and, and perhaps responsibility is part of it but to me, yeah, I guess, yeah, I guess maybe it is responsibility. I'll take it back. So, I mean, if you, I feel like I, there's this knowledge that I have and there's a reason for it. There, were, there was a very long time where I rejected my background. I did not want to identify myself as Arab. I did not want to identify myself of, of a background that's Muslim. But once September 11th happened... Well, why didn't you all, want to? It was too painful because of our return back to the Middle East and the way it happened and the separation from what I knew and loved in Winnipeg. I had resented the Middle East for a very long time. Yeah, and, and you can't be faulted. You mean you're going to be pissed off at your? Mind. I was really pissed did off. Did you have your, your <laughs> Did you have your uh, your moment with your father and say, "Let's deal with this"? We've had many conversations about it, and even my parents today. I mean still question whether it was the right thing to do or not. The one thing we all agree on, though, is that the best thing that could have happened out of it was us 
getting to know our family and learning the language. I mean, I, I, I wouldn't be here today if I, didn't know, if I didn't know Arabic. And so what's the story here that you need to tell? I think the story here is, and, and that's part of the reason I tell the story of what happened to us when we were young, is that there is a story that's been untold about the difficulty of being a first generation, second generation Canadian of, du of different, of dual culture. Right. And it's, it's a story that's been told on, you know, by people in the Indian culture or others, but I, I don't think it's been told from the Arab perspective but necessarily, the Afghan perspective. It's also very different from the, the, the typical the story you used to hear about Canadian immigration, mm -hmm. the immigrant story used to be about coming over here and assimilation, and assimilation is a small part of it, but it's not required. Yeah, exactly. You know, and a lot of assimilation was kind of family-based. Like your grandparents say, forget the language, be a Canadian, mm -hmm. or be an American, wherever you go. Precisely. And actually, we, I just did a story about this, that new generations of Canadians, new fir, you know, first born generations of Canadians, are finding it hard to figure out where they fit. Yeah. Do they fit in Canada, or do they fit where their homes are. I was a part of that little thing, and I and I, I have a Ukrainian mother and my father who I don't know that well. I was of Greek descent, and I just was like, I don't know. I'm, uh, maybe I identify as a Torontonian. I don't even know. Like maybe that's even to identify in a certain country is too complex these days. It's it has a lot to do with the parents. That's what the research says. And in our story, we we talked to the parents, and some of them were quite adamant, as my parents were in some way on getting their children to get to know that other culture and to think of it first. And so that's where the confusion comes from. The, the child goes, well, where am I, where do I belong? And I think it does, it takes time to figure that out. What's, what's stuck with you? Has there been a memorable moment, a memorable moment that you just can't shake? I, I mean, I, I, it's very difficult to rival the moment in Tahrir Square when Mubarak announced, or well, his deputy announced that he was leaving. I, I've never actually experienced <clears throat> the emotion of so many people in one moment, in one place. It was extraordinary, and I don't think I'll see anything like that again, probably in my lifetime. Just that explosion of energy? It was, it was incredible. It was just the, the raw emotion. There were people crying and singing, and I don't know, you know Egyptian culture probably. I mean, people love to sing, and they're yeah. happy, and they're boisterous and humorous, and it was all at once, like it was this big wedding in Tahrir Square. And so it, that was by far the most incredible moment that I but, ever had. And in that moment of all those people, if you think about it, everybody's experiencing it one at a time. So these are truly personal stories. You've, you've been in rooms with people, I'm assuming, in really vulnerable moments. Yes. How are you in those situations? I forget there's a camera there too. Yeah. yeah, I have to, because then you're just a human being and you're talking to someone and a lot of the time they're just unloading and you have to listen and I want to listen. And ever since I was a child, I wanted to listen. That's what I learned when I was a kid and that's what I still do as, a, as an adult. Is there a story that got away from you? that you really want? Well, I mean, I would say not being there for the, for the invasion in Iraq was a story. I wish, I wish I'd stayed. We did come back for and we saw the, the, the regime fall, but um, I wish we'd stayed there. Yeah, check the book out. A Thousand Farewells. It's really good to see you. Thank you so Very much. Very good to see you. Now, I had it, everybody. Thank you. We'll be right back.